I'm a part of the team here. Hey, if you are brand new here, one, we are just glad that you chose to spend part of your day with us. But two, we also have a gift for you. All you have to do is grab the card from the seat in front of you, take it to our new here area in the lobby, and then you'll get your free gift. So I wanted to shout something out really quick because I haven't done it in a while. So if you didn't know, we actually have a YouTube channel. And on that channel, not only do we have our weekly messages in case you missed one, but also we have a lot of other content. It ranges all the way from Brett responding to famous atheists about worldview questions to reacting to K-pop. Ooh, there's a new take on the pop and lock. <laughs> I'm glad you caught that. I'm glad you, you caught that. You didn't take it, Brett. I mean, That's Korean pop music for all you non-K-pop fans. So whatever you're into, I think you'll find something that you enjoy watching. And we're pushing closer and closer to getting 10,000 subscribers. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. Just search One Life Network on YouTube and you'll find us there. Okay, with that shameless plug aside, I do need to tell you something very important. So coming up on March 17th, we are having our baptism services. Now you probably already knew that, but what's important to know is that our baptism classes are starting up this week. When you sign up to get baptized, you're gonna be prompted to choose one of these classes. So if you or someone you know wants to sign up to get baptized, all you have to do is go to onelifechurch.info, hit events, and then you'll find the baptism sign up there. So apart from that, we have one more thing going on. We have our t-shirt design contest. Now we already had a handful of you send in your designs, which is very exciting. But if you haven't done that, there is still time. So designs are gonna be due on March 15th and you can email those to jimmymarshall at onelifechurch.org. And the theme for this year is build a great city. Because going into the Easter season, that's one of the things that we're gonna be talking a lot about. So make sure you send in those designs by March 15th. All right, that's all I have for you. So now let's start the day off right with the time of worship through music right now. Good morning, One Life. We are excited to have you here with us. We're excited to get to worship our God this morning too. So you guys are ready to get to your feet and worship him? If you guys are watching from home, just get into a posture of worship and prepare your heart to worship our God. You guys ready? Come on. Well, I search the world, but it couldn't feel me. Man's empty praise, treasures of faith are never enough. You came along, you put me back together. Thank you. 
But to break, shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. Shame has no choice but to leave in your presence. Come on. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no choice but to break. No choice but to leave in your presence. Fear has no choice but to bow. Chains have no 
choice but to break The shame has no choice but to leave In your presence So let the spirit rise up And break through the walls And beat down the doors And crash through the windows And cover the earth The earth, the earth, the earth Let the spirit rise up And break through the walls And beat down the doors
yourself this morning that death is never gonna hold you, so it's never gonna hold me, because he is the only thing holding on to us, amen? Readings from the Bible and church history. There was the truth, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of, of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let your children be partakers of true Christian training. Let them learn how great a veil humility is with God, how much the spirit of pure affection can prevail with him, how excellent and great his fear is, and how it saves all those who walk in it with a pure mind. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see.
you for this opportunity to come into your house and just praise you and worship you, Lord. And I just, I pray for the people in the room that don't know you, that they would just feel your presence right now, Lord, that you would just soften hearts and minds and that they would have ears to hear and eyes to see, Lord. I just thank you for dying on the cross, Lord, that because of that, I don't have to be afraid of death. I don't have to be afraid of what happens next because the victory and the battle is already won. So just thank you, Lord, for all the things that you're doing today and all the things that you have yet to do. And I just pray for Pastor Chris as he gives this message, that you would just anoint his words and that you would just give him the words to say, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. You know, if you think about it, one of the most unique and special experiences uh, church contributes to all of our lives is what just happened. We get to sing praises to God together. Uh, and thanks to all of you, and thanks to the worship teams for working hard to provide that time every single week. Well, going back to the beginnings of the historic church, generosity has always been a vital part of worship. And, and through it, we get to help one another, and we get to impact our community and even the world. Now, a great example of that, as Christmas was approaching this past year, a couple of months ago, we, we decided we wanted to bless our schools in this area. Our West Campus was able to give to Daniel Wirtz Elementary School, and our East Campus gave $50 gift cards to the entire teaching staff at Harrison. And you need to hear the thank you that we received from the principal at Harrison High School, and it's signed by all the teachers. It says this, I don't even know how to begin to thank you for your contributions and influence in our school culture at Harrison this year. Words cannot express the gratitude conveyed by our teachers for the Amazon cards that you sent. Unbelievable and so appreciated. I wish you could see the results of your efforts daily as I do. I'm so grateful for you, Tamara Skinner, uh, principal at Harrison. And you know, it's not hard to see how a little bit of generosity can make a big difference, not just physically, but obviously emotionally. It, it encourages people and that matters a a whole lot, especially to people that are working in our school system. Uh, now, let's keep that in mind as we go forward. And as I talk about a challenge that we're up against, going into the end of 2023, we told you that our financial picture has changed uh, due in large part to the fact that our Henderson campus is now a fully independent church. Now, for a couple years, they were still affiliated, but just had more local autonomy. And in that relationship, they would pay into our overall budget because we still provided services to them. But at the beginning of 2024, they no longer pay for services because they're truly independent. And that adds up up to a $125,000 shortfall in our budget this year. So granted, that sounds like pretty substantial, and it is, but here's the good news. First, at the end of 2023, we had some people give very generous and large gifts, and thanks to all of you, by the way. Second, we did a very detailed exploration of our budget and cut back anything we could. Now, third, at the beginning of 2024, we're growing numerically on levels we haven't seen since before the pandemic. Uh, so lots of new people are coming in the doors, which increases our capacity to solve problems. So simply put, to make up for the $125,000 $5,000 shortfall, we could do it if every household increased their giving by $250 over the course of this entire year. Now that's roughly $5 a week on top of your normal giving. And if you haven't been giving before, uh, you could step in with simply $5 a week. Uh, with that, the big sounding problem becomes small. And that's the beauty of working together. So please give that prayerful consideration. Uh, right now, we are beautifully positioned to make a tremendous impact in our city. And it's, and it's already happening like you heard with Harrison. Uh, uh, we just want to fan the flame of that, and everyone's giving helps uh, more than you know. There's three ways to give. The buckets are going around. You can also give at our website and on our app. And many, many thanks to all of you who are a part of our giving community. And now we're going to hear from our most excellent next-gen pastor, Chris Shadowin. A parenting hack that my parents use that I will use is not only my kids have social media. What became one of my very favorite parenting hacks was to pick a destination uh, three hours or more away. And if you have the means and ability and time and all that kind of thing, just take one of your kids by yourself, just the two of you, and go on a road trip. You get a lot of time while you're just in the car. You get a lot of time to talk. Uh, you can let them be the DJ uh, and control the music that you're listening to and just explore their lives. And it really does help get them out of con uh, the context that they're used to being in and engage in some conversation that you probably wouldn't be able to otherwise.
Well, hello and welcome. Welcome to those of you joining us online, those in the room. Thanks for being here. Um, we've been in the book of Proverbs looking at like different hacks, different things that we can look at, like just learn wisdom for life. And so the first month of January, we just talked about just life in general. And then this month has been all about relationships. And so I know when we get to kind of this point, because it's the last Sunday of February, people are like, okay, I'm not married. I don't have kids. Does any of this really apply to me and things like that? So this is parenting really part two, um, but... There is a lot for just for those of you that aren't parents or like your kids are grown up or whatever. But because today I, I want to really look at what does it mean to really live every day for Jesus. And so last week Brett talked about like the Proverbs part of of uh, parenting, which it's just a lot of discipline. Like train your kids in the way they should go, uh, spare the rod, spoil the child, that kind of thing. Like a lot of kind of like discipline type things. And so. Last week I get home, uh, it's Sunday afternoon, and I'm like doing some stuff around the house, and one of my kids uh, angered me. Like, uh, they did something that I didn't necessarily like, and so I was kind of frustrated, and so I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna say anything yet, I'm gonna just calm down, and I thought about it and all this stuff, and I'm like, okay, now I can address this issue, and so in a calm manner, which I thought, I was like, hey, this is what you did that frustrated me, and then that wasn't met very well, uh, and then I'm like, okay, well, hey, this is what we learned about in church today, and I want to tell you about some things from the Bible that are helpful to you right now at this time. And that was replied with, I don't want to hear your stupid stories, and was very angry. And I'm like, don't call the Bible stupid. And then I'm like, so, and then like, I didn't say the Bible was stupid. I just don't want to hear your <laughs> interpretation of it right now. So I'm like, great, this is going very well. Uh, and so, so then I, I calmed down, and like, and we were able to talk about it a little bit, but. Um, but I, I was telling this to my group of guys, my small group that I meet with on Wednesday mornings. And my friend Dan was like, is there any other times in your family that you bring up the Bible that's not telling somebody they're wrong and why you're right? I'm like, shut up, Dan. Nobody asked you. Like, <laughs> I was very frustrated because what I don't want is to raise my kids to like look at the Bible as this thing of shame where they're like, oh, I'm only talked about the Bible when it's telling me I'm wrong because that's not the relationship I want, one, for my kids to hear from the Lord, but I also don't want them to think of me as like the only time that we really have these conversations is when they're trying, when my dad's trying to shame me and tell me how he's right and how I'm wrong. And so we, what we, we're going to jump into today, we're going to look at Proverbs, we're going to go, uh, so we're going to look at Hebrews a little bit and Deuteronomy a little bit because I think What's missing sometimes from discipline, at least like from me, is that relationship. Like this is done out of I love you, and, and Brett talked about that last week. That love, uh, just, uh, like love and discipline go hand in hand, and so that comes from a relationship, and that's important because if the relationship's not there, there's a there's an issue. Because if I'm trying to just always punish my kids and tell them they're wrong and they don't know that I love them, then they're not gonna hear it from me or they're gonna be frustrated and things like that. So where we left off last week, we're gonna, hit, we're gonna start today. So Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, it says, do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son, and do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father disciplines a son in whom he delights. And so it's saying, like our discipline from the Lord should be like our earthly fathers disciplining us, and we should accept it as that. And actually, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, they quote, uh, the author quotes this verse, um, talking about like, hey, this is important, and he kind of gives some context to this verse. So Hebrews 12, 5 through 11, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. And so the context for what he's saying here is is Hebrews chapter 11 is called the Hall of Faith. And it's all these people that did great things for the kingdom of God, men and women both. And they're, they're in there of like, these are the people you should be looking up to. These are the people that you should follow your life after. And then it jumps into chapter 12 and it says, but there is this sin in our lives that easily entangles us. And so throw all that off and run this race with per perseverance. And then it says, but hey, but Jesus already fought this battle for you. And he went to and fought temptation and defeated it. And so therefore, you should be able to defeat it as well. And here's how you do this. And so now back to Hebrews 12, five. Sorry to the graphic people back there. But you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. So it's like, you've forgotten this part. And then he quotes the Proverbs passage. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives. 
And then he gives kind of the commentary on it. Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the father of spirits and live? For they, being the earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time based on what they seemed, what seemed good to them. But he, God, does it for our benefit so that we can share his holiness. Now this verse, I love this verse. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Because we don't like to be disciplined. We don't like to be told we're wrong. We don't like to be told, oh, this is not good for you or whatever. We're like, no, I did everything right. Like, we don't like to hear that. It's like my friend Dan, I didn't want to hear that from him, but I needed it because I need to be able to pass on my faith to my kids in a way that they love the Lord and aren't like, just feel like shame from him. But the Lord disciplines us out of love. Like this relationship, it's like, it's between, say like between a father and a son. This is how God views us. We are his Children, And so the punishment isn't because, oh, he's mad at us or he hates us or anything like that. No, like he knows how life works best. So he wants to train us and help us to be more like him. He's like, hey, this is gonna not go well for you. But if you follow my instruction and my discipline, like this will help you out. So I wanna be careful because that verse seven, it says endure suffering as discipline. So a lot of times we think like, oh, if something bad's happening, then it's the Lord disciplining me. So I've done something wrong. Or we feel like, oh man, this bad thing's happening. So what, what have I done? God's out to punish me. But it says endure suffering as discipline. So it's not saying that all bad things that happen are God punishing us, but it's because that punishment was taken by Jesus. And so, so we now are being disciplined and there might be things in our life that like we can look at and be like, oh, I'm suffering is there something that I've done that is causing this? Or is this just maybe spiritual warfare, maybe something just other people's sin or whatever, but I'm supposed to endure that suffering as discipline. So I'm supposed to learn from it and grow from it and become more disciplined as a result. And so there's kind of those two types of discipline, right? There's that training and then there's like the correction part of it. And so, so like a spiritual discipline is something we do like a, like a practice or a daily practice or if you work out and do sports, <laughs> like I do, uh, then it's, why, why is that funny, Well, uh, but, but when we like take on those things, right, like we are disciplined and we like, we do these things on a daily basis. We do things to train ourselves. Uh, and so we're supposed to, to take this suffering as discipline and learn from it and grow from it. And so this whole thing of discipline though is surrounded by the relationship. It has to be born out of this relationship of God to us, but also if we discipline our kids, it has to be born out of this relationship of, I love you and wants, want what's best for you. And that, that line in there where it says, uh, fathers punish their kids based on what seemed good to them, right? Because I don't always get it right, unfortunately. And so when I say, oh, it seems good to me, like I think I'm doing the right thing, like, oh, I'm telling my kid this Bible verse of why I'm right and they're wrong, like, ah, that wasn't good for them in that moment. And so I need to, to realize that and work through that. So we're going to jump into Deuteronomy. And so the first five books of the Old Testament are what's known as the, the books of the law. And they kind of set up and establish like, hey, this is how life works best. Like when you follow God in this manner, things will go well for you. And he tells them that. He's like, if you keep my words, th things are going to go well for you. But we mess up and we sin. And so uh, the first five books are establishing what does it look like to have a relationship with God and how do we do that? And so it's God taking the Israelite nation and saying, hey, this is how life works best. In Deuteronomy chapter five, he talks about the 10 commandments, the big 10, right? And the first four deal with our relationship with God and the second six deal with our relationship with other people. And so he's saying, hey, when, if you're gonna live life to the fullest, your relationship with God has to be solid and your relationship with other people has to be solid. And then chapter six of Deuteronomy is basically like, hey, here's how you take these things and pass them on to the next generation so that they're not lost. And so verse four of Deuteronomy chapter six, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house 
and on your city gates. And so this, this first part is kind of known, it's known as the Shema in the Jewish culture. And so Shema is just the Hebrew word for listen. And the thing about the word listen is that it's a word that is not just I mean, like I heard what you said. It's I'm, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm gonna put it into action. And so the word Shema, it, like there's not another word for obey because the word obey is the same as Shema. It means I'm gonna listen to what you say and then I'm gonna take it in and I'm going to do what you say. And so he says, listen, Israel. Like, listen, not just hear this, but obey what I'm saying. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, this is important because the Israelite nation at the time of this writing was just taken out of slavery for the last 430 years. So generations have been in slavery in the land of Egypt. And Egypt had multiple gods. And so they would see sometimes like, oh, they prayed to this God and this thing happened. Or they would kind of get this idea in throughout the rest of the Old Testament. That's what they struggled with. They would struggle with these foreign lands saying like, oh, our God did this for us. And they're like, well, okay, we'll follow that God and we'll do this. And so he's like, no, there's, there's one God and I'm him. So please listen, not me, but God saying this. So verse five, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And so Jesus quotes this passage when he's asked, what is the greatest commandment? What is the, out of all the rules and laws, what's the greatest? He says, this one. Because it's saying, there's one God, and here's how you're to love him. You're to love him with every part of who you are. Your heart, your soul, your strength, all of the stuff that makes you, you, or to love God with those things. And so it has to start there. And then six, these words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. So we have to know these things if we're gonna pass them on to, to the next generation or to our kids or to our coworkers or classmates or whatever it may be. We have to know them ourselves before we can pass it on to somebody else. That doesn't mean you have to have the whole Bible memorized or things like that, but these are things that we have to know if you're gonna pass that on to somebody. Because if you were going to college and you went to, and the professor's like, hey, I'm taking a class on this too so I can teach you guys. Like, I, I think I would like you to know this a little more than like you just heard it from another guy the day before. And so, so we need to know this stuff so that we can help pass this on to the next generation. One of the greatest gifts you can give your children is a framework for living daily for the Lord. And so it has to be personal to you, and that relationship has to be there with you in order for you to pass this on to the next generation. And so I think the next couple of verses are him laying out the framework of how do we do this on a daily basis with our children or with those around us and things like that. And so we're gonna give like the example for kids and then example for if you don't have kids or you're just trying to build that framework in your own life. And so your life is telling a story. Your daily disciplines tell a story. The things that you do each day, the way that you handle your job, the way that you handle parenting, the way you handle friends, relationships, all that stuff is telling a story. And if you have kids, they're reading that story sometimes closer than you would like for them to. Uh, but the people that you work with, the people that you're around on a daily basis, they're hearing your story. They're hearing what you're saying with your life. And so we're gonna jump back into Proverbs just for a second. So Proverbs 20, verse seven, it says, a righteous person acts with integrity. His children who come after him will be happy. And so one of the words we use around here is authenticity. It just means like we're authentic with the way we live, but we have integrity with how we live. And so that means Chris up on stage is the same guy that you'll meet out in the lobby, the same guy that you'll meet at my house, the same guy that you'll meet in all areas of my life. Because I want to be authentic and I want to have integrity. And that's what we strive to do. It says a righteous person acts with integrity. And so when we have this daily framework of living with Jesus, we will be people of integrity. And yes, we're still gonna mess up and things like that. But then it says his children who come after him will be happy. And so, so even if you don't have kids, and maybe way off in the future for some of you, or maybe you're like, I'm never gonna have kids or whatever, we can still have a daily framework of how do we live for Jesus. And so um, we're, gonna, we're gonna start with, with uh, James Clear's book, Habits, um, what's the, Atomic Habits. Because he says, when I do this, when I blank, then I blank. So it's like, oh, we have a daily habit of brushing your teeth. So when I brush my teeth, I'm going to add this to it. And so we want to start thinking of in terms of how do I grow my spiritual disciplines? And so kind of have that framework in mind of, okay, I already do this in my life. So how can I do these other things? And that's what it really this whole, the rest of this passage is about. So verse seven, again, of Deuteronomy chapter six, it just says, repeat them to your children. So if you're going to repeat something to somebody, again, you have to know it yourself. So if you know it, then repeat it. And then it says, then talk about them when you sit in your house. So 
I don't know about you, I like to sit around my house, especially Sunday afternoon, we go sit around and like play video games, watch TV, just kind of lounge, like just rest and relax. But it says, take those moments of sitting around the house. So family dinners, like I, I know people are busy with their lives a lot, but this is a great example. Like find a time around that maybe even once a week where you can sit around the table together and have these conversations. And hopefully it'll be more than that. But this is where they learn your values. This is where your kids learn like how you interact and how you do things as a family. Now, I'll tell you, I have four kids and my youngest is seven months. And so he'll sit in his high chair and just, he's learning what noises are now. So he's like, ah! And like he's like all over the place. They were like trying to have a conversation. He's just like making crazy noises. Uh, and then I have two kids that sit across from each other, my daughters, and they just like kick each other under the table and we'll push each other's chairs. And one will go breathe heavily. And the other one's like, quit breathing on me. You're getting germs in my eyes. Or like, I don't know. They just fight over that. My six-year-old, he like will take a bite and then run down the hallway, flip, and then come back and like take another bite. Like, this is crazy. But when I found my daughter got a book, uh, like, Would You Rather for Christmas. And so, like, on those nights when she's like, hey, I got this, let's do this. It's like, would you rather have spaghetti legs or pickle arms? And we're like, I don't know. And so is it hard spaghetti or is it soft spaghetti? It's like, like if you got pickle arms and you take a bite, does it regrow? And you have these, like, really weird conversations. It's bizarro. But what ends up happening, though, is that then you have, like, like some deeper questions, like would you rather go a day without water or a day without food? And then we'll talk about that and why. And then from that though, we can springboard like, okay, well what about people around the world that don't have water and food? Is there things that we can do as a family to start like helping them or pray for them or things like that? And it, it can lead to deeper discussions and that's up to you as a parent to be able to say, okay, this is where I can start directing this. For some, dinner time doesn't work because it's either too crazy or you don't know how to cook or whatever. But sometimes we sit around and watch TV. So afterward, what can you do to like say, okay, hey, we just watched this show. What were some of the things they talked about? What was the worldview of that show? And then you can start saying, okay, here's what a Christ-centered worldview looks like and start shaping your kids in those things. If you want a great resource for that, there's a podcast that Jimmy and myself and my sister do every week. It's called Worldview Finder and it's uh, on the, the Next Gen channel on our YouTube page. So you check that out. But we do, we talk about things that are going on in culture because we want you as families to have those discussions with your kids. So the other thing though, if you don't have kids, whatever, there are times where you eat meals with other people or maybe by yourself. And in those moments, like, okay, how can I use this time to grow my relationship with the Lord? Or after I watch a show, can I like sit down and maybe write down like, okay, this is what it says about life and truth and all that stuff. And here's what the Bible says about those things. And just think about those things in your life. So when you're sitting around the house, what's something you can start doing to say, okay, God, I'm going to give this time over to you. The next part of that, uh, it says, so while you walk along the road. So I just take this to be like, when you're on the road, when you're driving, if you have younger kids until they're like 16 and start driving themselves, you have a lot of time in the car with your kids. Because you are a chauffeur, or taxi, Uber driver, whatever, uh, for a long time with your children. And so in those moments, okay, maybe it's not the whole car ride, but hey, is there something you can put on a worship song and sing it together and talk about what it means? There's version plans where you can just listen to part of the Bible together. There's great podcasts that you can listen to. There's, there's a lot of other good podcasts out there too, but there's things that you can do in the car ride. Like one thing that we do sometimes, not all the time, but like if an ambulance goes by or something as we're driving, we'll just stop and pray for that family. And like it just kind of incorporates like, okay, this is just something small that you can do in that moment to kind of get your kids to think about the people around them and the things like that. And you can even explain like, this is why we pray for people because God does something when we pray. He loves when his people pray and when his kids talk to him. And so that's why we pray. So just think about those times when you're in the car together. And if you, again, don't have kids and like, like a lot of times like driving the car is the only time I have free time. I have four kids and all this stuff. I'm like, ah, relax. Uh, but I usually get in, I put on music, I put on books on tape, or audio books, books on tape, look how old I am, uh, but audio books, things like that, we'll do different things, like I'll like, just fill that time, because ah, I finally have time to myself, I can listen to the podcast I wanna listen to, all, all this stuff, but it's like, okay, I need to take that time to be like, okay, maybe the first few minutes I just pray, or maybe I listen to the Bible app, or do something to kind of focus my attention on the Lord in that time, and so, so then the habit like, when I get in the car, I pray. Or when I get in the car, I listen to a chapter of the Bible. It can be as easy as that. Because I know a lot of times like, oh, I'm too busy to read the Bible. You can listen to a little bit while you drive in the car. Um, then when I lie down, 
right? When you talk about when you lie down. So this is what I've noticed about preschoolers that at bedtime, they become dehydrated philosophers, right? Like they are so thirsty all of a sudden. They're like, I haven't drank in months. I'm in the desert. And they're like, what? I, you just drank a lot of water brushing your teeth. They're like, I need more. And so you have to go get them water. And then they like you sit down like, if God could make a rock so big, did, could he not lift it? You're like, what? Why now? You're like, we'll talk about this in the morning. I don't know. Uh, but they have like these deep questions and all this stuff. And like, where's grandma? Like, ah. Uh, and so there's like these just deep things that they ask in those moments. You're like, oh man. But those are good times to, to have these conversations or to pray over your kids. Now, um, we heard a guy named Sean McDowell a couple weeks ago. Um, he spoke just about raising kids and that kind of thing. But one of the things he talked about, he's like, growing up, he's like, I always thought I had to have a Bible study time with my kids. Uh, like, I thought that there had to be a family Bible study and things like that. And after Brett and I were talking, and Brett's like, yeah, Pastor Brett, he's like, I thought that too. He's like, as a pastor, I thought I had to have this Bible study with my kids. He's like, it failed. He's like, we ended up fighting more during that Bible study and people yelling and we left angry after that Bible study. And what Sean McDowell said, he's like, hey, just do these things, right? Like in Deuteronomy, like if you're doing these things, he's like, you're incorporating scripture into their life in other areas so you don't have to sit down and have a Bible study. If you can with your kids sit down and have a Bible study, please do it because that's a great thing to do. I, it doesn't work for my family. And like hearing that, I was like, I felt guilty not having a Bible study with my kids all the time. And it's like, oh, you don't have to do that. So my son Shepard and I, like we'll read uh, just a small, it's like a kid's Bible. We read um, a chapter of that each night. And with my daughters, like I'll go in and pray with each of them uh, at nighttime. But it's just kind of this bedtime routine of like, hey, we pray, we read the Bible, we, we do these things, but we don't have to do it all together because that doesn't always work. And so don't feel like you have to. Um, and when you get up, so morning routine, like what is it in the morning? Like brush your teeth, you shower. Like what are some things you can start implementing in those times? Can you put something on your mirror to remind you like here's a verse for the day? Or as your kids are walking out of the house, like hey, we're gonna pray together right before we go. Or maybe you can have breakfast together. That might be your meal time, and just share a Bible study or something like that. And so you, you have to know your rhythms. But again, if you don't have kids, like the thing for me, like I used to like lay down and read my Bible and pray right before bed. But my phone kind of replaced that time. And I, I'm like realizing, especially as I was studying for this, I'm like, oh, a lot of the things that I used to do and have those moments, I'm like, my phone has ruined that. It's like, the Lord your God is one, not your phone. Like, oh yeah, that's true. And so, so are there things in your life that you can be like, okay, I need to set electronics aside because this is taking up my time or this is filling up time that I should be engaging with scripture, engaging with God in those moments. And then just those last two um, verses eight and nine. It says, bind them as signs on your hand. Let them be as symbols on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. Just, I, I think it's just saying, put scripture everywhere. Like just so that you read it, that you're reminded of it and change it up. Because if it's there forever, you're like, ah, I just, I don't read it anymore. But, but have those things in mind as you go about your day. Because what, the, what they're talking about here in Deuteronomy is saying, every area of my life should have some element of me talking about scripture, thinking about scripture, praying, just building that relationship with God. And when I do that, when I'm building a daily framework, then that thing is gonna be passed on to my kids or it's gonna be my coworkers are going to see that or the people that I go to school with, like the people around me are gonna see that. And they're gonna know like, oh, this is something that's important to them. And it doesn't make it weird later when you're like, hey, do you wanna come to Easter with me? Like, oh, I didn't know you went to church. Like, oh, well, I do. Like, well, Shouldn't have told that joke last week. I don't know. But there's, a, there's that, that mindset, right? Of like, when, when I do this on a daily practice and people see that within me, and so it's easier to pass on. Sunday morning cannot be the only time that your kids are learning about Jesus. Because if, because we, we have, like we do, the, the lesson time is about 15 minutes of Bible teaching. That's like the attention span of our K through third graders. Sometimes it's 20 minutes. Depends on who's talking. But that 20 minutes a week can't be the only time that they hear about Jesus during the week. It can't be. The same with you guys. Sunday morning can't be the only time that you're learning about Jesus. If it is, that's a problem. Just like you wouldn't eat one meal a week, you'd be like, oh, this is gonna sustain me for the week. No, it's a daily practice. It's, it's multiple times a day that we're, we're filling up with the things of God. We're listening to God. We're praying. And I think a lot of times we think, oh, I have to pray and say all these words. No, there's a part of prayer that's just listening and listening to what God's saying. And a lot of times, because my kids will be like, well, I don't hear him talk back. I was like, well, he does that through his word. Have you been reading the Bible? Because that's how God speaks to us a lot of the times is through the Bible. So remember, your life is telling a story. If 
if Sunday morning is the only time that your kids see you in worship or hear about, like, sometimes you drop them off and they don't even see you in worship. And so the only time you talk about Jesus on the car at home, like, hey, what'd you learn about? Oh, Zacchaeus again, that's good. Uh, and then like, you go on with your day. No, it's gotta be multiple conversations throughout the day, throughout the week. So Proverbs 13.1 and Proverbs 15.31, they just say this. This is a wise son responds to his father's discipline, but a mocker doesn't listen to rebuke. And then 31, 15.31 says, one who listens to life-giving rebukes will be at home among the wise. So there are gonna be times that you're gonna have to discipline your kids. There's gonna be times you have to discipline yourself of like, hey, I need to focus on this or whatever. But saying the, the wise people do that. They listen to the rebukes. They listen to the things that are going wrong and correct those things. And when you have that relationship with your kids, when you've built that as a daily basis, they're gonna be more likely to hear it and receive it. And again, no discipline's fun at the time. They're not gonna be like, oh, thank you, Father, for telling me how bad I am. Like, you know, it's not gonna be like that. But it says like, okay, they don't maybe realize it at the time, but later they're gonna realize like, oh, this was true and he was helping me in this way or she was helping me in this. So I wanna talk about Sean McDowell again because he wrote a book called So the Next Generation Will Know and this is our Wednesday night class. We've been studying this. Um, but one of the things he, he quotes a study that they did that there's, it's still ongoing. It started in the 70s and it was done to see like why does faith pass on from one generation to the next? What is it about faith um, transmission from one generation to the next? And this guy has been doing this study for many years now, and now it's been four generations. And so um, Sean McDowell talks about it. He says, regardless of the particular religion, he has found that a warm relationship with the parents, and in particular the father, is the single most important factor in faith transmission. It's not knowing the deep theological ins and outs of the fall of man. It's not these, knowing every book of the Bible. It's not it's a warm relationship with the parents, especially the dad. And then short behind that is the grandparents, the grandparents' influence, and then the faith community influence. And so one of the things that, that has been important to me in my years of doing middle school ministry and youth ministry is that we have a team of small group leaders that are solid in their faith so that when kids come in here, especially from broken homes or from rough situations, that they have somebody that's going to be consistent in their life that's going to point them to Jesus. And that's what we do in our kids ministry. That's what we do in our student ministry. That's one of the things that is important to me because I know that our society now, like the divorce rates, 50% and all this stuff. And so, so a lot of times kids come in here and don't have a good male role model in their home or don't have parents that model this stuff to them. And so the only time they do hear about Jesus is once a week because some friend brought them or whatever it may be. And we want to make sure that we're providing a, a way for them to, to see Christ modeled through our small group leaders and things like that. And that's why like, we ask a lot for people to come and be small group leaders in our student ministry and in our kids ministry. And there's things that we want to see happen and that takes people to do that. And so if you've ever thought like, okay, maybe I can't do this or whatever, it's just showing up and hanging out with kids. They love it. And so if that's you and you're like, I need to help like, start instilling these values in the next generation, you talk to me or Will afterward, um, or if you're online, just email Will. He'll come to your house. <laughs> no, 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 he won't. That's weird. All right. But okay, your life is telling a story. And it's either pointing to the things of the Lord. It's either saying, hey, God is awesome and he is the boss of my life and I wanna make him known in every area of my life. And yeah, you're gonna mess up, but part of telling your story is saying, hey, I messed up in this area and you're asking for forgiveness. That's another great thing you can do with your kids. Tell them you're sorry. Because you don't always get it right as a parent. And I know I don't. And so like apologizing like almost daily, like finding those things like, man, here's where I really messed this up. And so like preparing for this, I had to go follow up with my kid that, uh, that story at the beginning. I had to follow up with my child and be like, hey, I don't want you to hate the Bible. <laughs> and so, so let's figure out ways that we can talk about it more than just when I, I want to tell you you're wrong. So, um, but what, what is your life story telling? And, and I think from these examples, sit, a, sit in your house, walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, one of those four areas you can say, hey, this week, I'm gonna figure out one of those areas that I can, I can start saying, okay, God, this is my, my time, but I'm, I'm gonna give this over to you. I wanna, I wanna start praying more when I get in my car. I wanna start, when I lie down, I wanna pray. And maybe something as a family, like just think of one thing you can do as a family. Maybe it's 
family meal time, but it's like, okay, we're gonna have a question of the day or we're gonna do good thing, bad thing. Like just say, hey, this is what good happened today, this is what bad happened today. And just talk about those things. But, but in it, share a Bible verse or say, oh, hey, that's, man, I'm sorry that your friend's going through that. Let's actually pray for her right now and just take those moments to, to instill God into your kids in those moments or even in your own life if you're not in the parenting phase. And so if you're not a follower of Jesus though, your life is telling a story as well. And is it telling how great you are? Is it telling how awful things can be in times? Or, or what, what is your life story telling? And if, if it's not telling the story of Jesus, is it telling a story that you want? And if not, maybe, just maybe, following Jesus is where it's at because he does discipline us. And even when we're not a part of his family, like he still uses that discipline to say, hey, this is the right way to live. And I, I want you to do that because he says he wants to give us life and that to the fullest. And so what's one thing that you can do this week to start making your life tell the story of Jesus even more, whether it's with your family or your own personal life, with your coworkers, with the people that you're in contact with on a daily basis, what can you start doing to make much of God? Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you, one, that you want to have a relationship with us, that you prove that through the, the cross, but also just through the, all the Old Testament of the ways that you showed up and tried to direct your people to live a life for you. And God, we can't do it apart from you. So if there's anyone here today that's just trying on their own to live their life and do the right thing and do all the stuff that they think will make them happy, Lord, I pray that today you would show them if they don't have a relationship with you, it's never gonna work out the way that they want. And they would just give their life over to you and say, God, be the boss of my life. Forgive me because I've messed up and tried to do it on my own. I need forgiveness of my sin. May I follow after you. Lord, for those of us that have been on this journey for a while or maybe just starting out on this journey, Lord, we, we all need this. I, I need more discipline in my life every day. And so, Lord, help us this week to, to show us those things of the ways we can engage more with you and with the world around us and be able to um, really dive into what it means to live daily for you. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Wait, you may have